Hi, everybody. Welcome to the IWRA webinar today on the OECD Principles on Water Governance. We're really happy to have you with us today, and we have a great panel lined up, and we are going to get started in just one or two minutes. So it gives you a chance to get a last cup of coffee or tea or water or whatever it is, depending on the hour of day you're joining us. And uh, we look forward to having a great webinar and a great panel for you here in a few minutes. Thank you so much for joining us. Why don't you put this? Oh, no. No? Ah, yeah, yeah. Hi okay. everybody. Gerana, it's good to see you. Huh? It's been a while. Yeah, yes, yes. I'm coming back. I see. I see. Actually, we saw um, Claire uh, a few a few weeks ago. Um, it's been a while, also for Susanna and uh, Uta. Good to see you guys. Thank you. Hi, Azita. Good to see you. Bonjour Claude. Bonjour. <laughs> All right, let's give everyone just one more minute here. Uh, I know some people like to run late, as I do, so I always forgive people when they're just a second or two late. Um, but this is the IWRA webinar on the principles of water governance. So if you're just joining us now, um, we'll be starting in just one or two minutes. So. Please uh, hold on tight, and we'll have a great panel for you of um, practitioners and academics uh, ready to speak about this great research and this initiative. So, thank you. Okay, well, my clock, it's uh, two minutes after four o'clock, so I think it's a good time for us to get started. Welcome, everybody, to the International Water Resources Association webinar for the OECD Principles on Water Governance. We have a really great panel lined up for you here today. Um, we're going to discuss a lot of different research that went into both the history and background of these principles of water governance and some of the case studies um, where they kind of are applied. So what we have today here is Aziza Azmush from the Director of Cities um, and the former uh, Director of the Water Governance uh, Group at the OECD. Um, Claude Menard, who is a Professor Emeritus at the uh, Sorbonne. Uh, Susan Neto, a Senior Researcher from the University of Lisbon. Uta Wynn, Associate Professor at the IHE Delft. And Pierre Alain Roche, who's on the advisory council of the Ministry of Sustainable and Inclusive Development in France. Um, so uh, we have a really great panel lined up. I'm really excited about this. And um, this is just to remind you um, a webinar hosted by the International Water Resources Association. And the IWRA is an international network of researchers and practitioners who work on a really wide, multiple range of water research. Um, we're a nonprofit, non governmental educational organization. And we provide a global knowledge based forum for bridging disciplines and geographies by connecting the professionals, students, individuals, corporations, and institutions everyone who's interested in the sustainable use of the world's water resources. So we're all really happy to have you here with us today, uh, tuning in. Um, like I said, we have this panel of bringing, I'm very excited about this, having not just academics as we sometimes do, but also um, having practitioners who have a little bit more background experience as well as a more analytical research background. So we have both sides coming together today to uh, really explore these questions around the uh, water, uh, water governance. So, um, and what many of you know is that um, these webinars are based on special issues of our journal, Water International, um, and that so 
you can go to our website, uh, if you just type in Water International uh, at WRA, and you'll see that many of these are open access uh, articles that anyone can access. So even if you're not connected to a research university that might be um, Taylor and Francis, our publishers, have provided many of our articles open access. So please go ahead and uh, go ahead and give us a look and, and give them a read um, to get deeper into the issues after you've seen the presentations. Um, so also we'd like to, you know, invite you beforehand to extend the conversation after the event um, by going to our LinkedIn webpage. Um, and so we'll have a nice discussion there. So if there's any of these issues really people interest and you want to follow up later, please go to our LinkedIn webpage and find out more. Um, just to let you know how the, the panel will be proceeding, um, we're going to have presentations from each of our five panelists. Um, and those will be about 10 minutes long with the PowerPoint. And then we'll have a time open for audience questions. So as you'll see there on your GoToWebinar control panel, uh, towards the bottom it says questions. Um, and if you click there, and then you can type your question and I will see it directly. So please let me know if you want to direct your question to one of the panelists, or if you have a question that more connects through a couple of the different panels and the themes that you're hearing about today. Um, I'd like to ask, you know, if, if, if it's a question very particular about one person's presentation, go ahead and follow up directly with that person. Um, just go ahead and look them up on the internet, uh, use their work email address, and send them a quick question. All of our panelists are extremely friendly, and I'm sure we'll be able to follow up on particular details. Um, and, you know, so try to make your questions a little bit uh, more broad-based, so kind of bring in a, a broader, richer discussion debate um, around the water principles. Um, so that's great. Um, and then at the end of the, uh, the presentation, we'll have after the 90 minutes, we'll have a quick uh, around the uh, clock uh, summary by each of our uh, present presenters, and uh, we'll kind of uh, give those final thoughts. So thank you very much for coming to join us today. Um, the first person we have uh, lined up is Aziza Azmush uh, from the OECD. So Aziza, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, um, uh, Scott, and I uh, would really like to start with uh, big thanks to all those who have uh, participated in this uh, big journey that we started about uh, a year and a half ago. And I would like to thank in particular within IWRA, uh, Kaloum and uh, Patrick and uh, Jim also in the editorial board that have been very supportive. And also the editorial board of this uh, special issue uh, uh, for, for their uh, contribution to this initiative. I, I'll be saying a few words about um, the what, uh, uh, meaning the content of the principles uh, that have actually sparked uh, the, the discussion with the different stakeholders and generated these articles bundled under uh, the special issue, but also, if not more importantly, about why we have done this together and how we've been uh, trying to work uh, in a bit of a different way uh, to come up with this special issue. Um, I'm not sure if the 60 plus attendants or 70 I see now are all uh, familiar with the OECD principles on water governance. I have a slide actually that uh, I'm, I'm going to show you now and that is going to be uh, the only slide uh, used on, on, on our side. Uh, which is this wheel with the uh, what the OECD came up with uh, about three years ago um, as principles on water governance uh, that have since then been uh, included in what we call an OECD Council recommendation on water uh, that uh, covers five main areas, um, uh, water quality, water quantity, um, water disasters, water financing, and water governance, and the principles were, were actually translated verbatim in this uh, uh, piece of legislation of the organization now. It's one of the 200 plus uh, legal instruments that we have to um, uh, frame common denominators for OECD member and some non-member countries to shape uh, their, their policies. Um, but before we got there, uh, and that's very important, there's been a, a, a three-year process within the, the Water Governance Initiative, uh, which is this multi-stakeholder network that the OECD launched back in 2013, and that gathers um, every six months in a policy forum uh, about 100 uh, institutions to discuss uh, water governance issues, but most importantly, in between. 
plenary meetings, uh, does a number of things together with its members, and uh, and this special issue is is actually one of them. All the authors that we'll be presenting today are uh, members of this initiative. So uh, the principles basically uh, lay down what. Um, we considered in this collective task with the stakeholders and in, in the different milestones to consult with a broad range of, of authorities, uh, the, the 12 framework conditions to get uh, uh, robust uh, design and implementation of what the policy is looking at the uh, who is doing what, uh, at which scale and how basically. And they, uh, as you see from uh, the wheel on the screen, are, are clustered around three big blocks. Uh, a block that has to do with the effectiveness of water governance, to what extent uh, governance actually helps hit uh, the policy goals, the objectives. Uh, and there you have principles related to the allocation of roles and responsibilities, to the scale at which water uh, in its different sub uh, functions is managed, to coherence between water, land, energy, agriculture, and, and other sectoral policies, and to capacity. There's a second block that has to do with efficiency, and that's mainly how you do this at the least cost. And this is where we featured um, uh, principles related to data and information, to financing, to regulation, and to innovation. And there's a third block that has to do more with the inclusive dimension, the trust and engagement, as we called it, where we put issues of integrity, transparency, stakeholder engagement, uh, trade-offs across users, across rural and urban uh, places, across current and future generations, and monitoring and evaluation. And these principles, they're accessible online. You have them in 16 uh, languages. Uh, they have been adopted by all OECD 35 countries back in, in uh, May 2015 by the Regional Development Policy Committee of the OECD. And they were endorsed uh, by ministers um, at the June 2015 ministerial uh, conference. And since then, a lot of work uh, has been completed and will be actually released at the World Water Forum um, with a, 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 a stock taking of progress um, in the use of these principles, but also an indicator framework and, uh, and a bit of a methodology for collecting and, and learning from uh, water governance practices. So this is the, the, the rational, I would say, the starting point that, that has come out of 10 years of work at the OECD, either um, comparing multi-level governance gaps across countries, either uh, supporting specific water reforms, um, in countries, in cities, in basins, or uh, uh, discussing with uh, member countries and, and stakeholders at large about the, the main bottlenecks that, that hinder uh, the proper design and implementation of, of policy. So they're conceived really as the common denominator that can help shape uh, better policies for better lives. Now, uh, in addition to having been en endorsed by OECD member countries, they were also backed and endorsed by over 140 stakeholder organizations. And there we have um, uh, basin organizations and their networks. We have a number of utilities. We have representatives from different users, um, uh, donor agencies, uh, NGOs, uh, regulatory agencies, a diversity of stakeholders, whether they're members or not of the OECD Water Governance Initiative. Initiative. And when doing so, they actually uh, committed uh, in endorsing these principles to use them to the extent possible to guide their, their <laughs> daily activities and, and practices. And that's uh, basically the way we have conceived them as a tool for dialogue uh, in a given state, in a given uh, basin, in a given city to uh, have a discussion with the different stakeholders involved in water management about the performance of their uh, governance system. Um, this endorsement uh, uh, has taken place since the adoption of the principles, as I was saying, back in, in 2015. Um, and one of the things that, uh, that we were discussing with uh, IWRA, and at the time in my capacity of members of the board, 
uh, of the of the association uh, is is how we could basically document uh, the way these principles have been used since their adoption and uh, how they have provided either a, a tool for dialogue or a, a, a reading template for assessment or uh, a reality check uh, uh, to how things are being done. And uh, it seemed to us that it was very important to uh, uh, strike a good balance between uh, robust uh, uh, research and, and rigorous uh, uh, scientific uh, methods and having uh, a leading academic academics uh, in this area engaged into the process, but also uh, um, practitioners, policy makers, and making sure that the experiences that would be reflected would go much beyond the academic view and also integrate the, the reality check that can be provided from uh, the ground. And that's why uh, we did a, a call for contribution within the Water Governance Initiative for papers, articles that could uh, feed into this special issue and that would uh, uh, basically be multi-stakeholder by nature, uh, led by academics, but also um, including other institutions, think tanks, operators, regulators, youth representatives, and you have, if you look at the list of co-authors, quite a diverse uh, uh, set in there, and, and that would basically uh, not provide an assessment per se, but an, an indication of how the principles have been used, and you have in the articles um, that feature in the special issue really different angles that 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 are very interesting to provide um, uh, this uh, this understanding of of, of how they can be useful to guide uh, uh, decisions or, or or reflections at large so uh, out of this call actually uh, we have uh, uh, had the pleasure to receive uh, uh, five uh, uh, well a number I had to say of articles and abstracts uh, that then uh, had to uh, be fine-tuned and and uh, for which we really insisted to have the multi-stakeholder nature um, they have all gone through uh, the, the traditional uh, uh, and usual peer review uh, process of, of the journal and, and therefore, as I said, providing this very nice balance between concrete uh, operational experiences and, and more theoretical conceptual uh, frameworks. And I think that they contribute today to really shed light uh, on, on this idea, and I will conclude with that, that, that governance is not only government, and, and that's really our ambition in, in developing these standards to make sure that they can actually uh, be used much beyond uh, uh, decision makers in the traditional ministries uh, or, or local governments and that they can really serve as a one-stop shop uh, uh, tool to put people around the table and to have an open and transparent uh, discussion on how the system is performing, where actions are needed and who can basically do what. Um, so this is just a bit of background to tell you uh, what the, the starting point is. I have to say when we kicked off the initiative, uh, we, we had doubts, but we also had a lot of confidence that this was making sense in the very process of developing the articles. There's been a lot of iterations, a lot of discussions, a lot of stimulations within uh, co-authors that would have uh, that would have not necessarily worked with each other uh, if it uh, was not for that specific initiative or for that specific topic. So we're really proud of uh, of, uh, of of this and the fact that uh, it has basically uh, fulfilled uh, its intended objective in terms of uh, stimulating dialogue across different types of stakeholders uh, around the principle. So I really look forward to the, the presentation of the papers and, uh, and the questions from, uh, from the audience. We take this as the beginning uh, and there will be uh, further uh, milestones coming uh, on the OECD side uh, around the indicator framework that we uh, uh, have now finalized for these principles. And, and other supporting tools that we are uh, um, disseminating and, and, and hoping to, to have a, a great uptake uh, at different scales and in, in different countries. So thank you very much for the initiative and, and I look forward to the, to the discussion. I just want to conclude thanking also my colleague Delphine Clavreul that many of you have uh, 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 seen or or discussed with in the development of this special issue. Uh, she's not here today because she transitioned to new functions in our, in our director's office, but she's really the masterpiece that has uh, uh, facilitated all, all, all these special issues uh, uh, discussion, and, and we look forward to the, to the outcomes of the webinar. 
Well, thank you so much for that presentation. I really appreciated that. And I thought it gave us a good starting place to hear what's going to go here at some of the other uh, submissions to the special issue. Um, and I really want to also thank you for, for putting together what I think is a really uh, unique and interesting um, and I, first, I, I know of it, you know, really uh, co combining this sort of uh, uh, public sector with the academic and, and having it kind of published, like you said, through the peer review process. Um, I think that kind of makes a really special, interesting combination. And like you said, brings together a lot of different uh, groups that maybe weren't going to work together before. So uh, this is a really great initiative. And thank you so much for, for spearheading this and, and having this come through your office. So our next speaker is Claude. Minard um, from the Sorbonne. So, Claude, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Thank you all for this uh, initiative. Uh, let me first pay tribute to, sorry, do you see that? Do you see a slide? Yeah, uh, you, you need to get rid of yours. Uh, yeah, now we do. Mm -hmm. Yep, yeah. just make it full screen there. Yeah. That looks perfect. Okay. That looks Okay, well, let, first of all, let me pay tribute to my two co-authors, uh, Alejandro Jimenez and I can trap. This was really a joint venture. Uh, and as Aziza said, it gave us the opportunity to work together, which we have not done before. Uh, I would like also to thank Water International and uh, IWRE for both the special issue and the uh, webinar. It's a very nice opportunity to present the ideas of our paper. Um, the paper is addressing the policy implementation gaps in water services with an emphasis on a specific set of institutions, and I will clarify that in a, in a minute. So let, let me first mention the highlight of the paper. The, highlight of the, paper the, the main point that we wanted to make is that many policy gaps, maybe most policy gaps, are, uh, are basically developing at the implementation level. So we have emphasized a lot in the paper, the implementation level. And we've tried to identify the main gaps. I will come back to all these issues in a minute, uh, mostly from our experience uh, with developing countries, although not exclusively, but uh, we have been involved in many different projects and there was a complementarity between uh, the three of us in that respect. Uh, we emphasize also uh, in the paper that these gaps are coming from a specific set of institutions that we identify as intermediate or meso institution that are very much connected to the issue of governance, as I will point out in, in a minute. And also through the paper, of course, we made a lot of uh, connection with the principles of uh, on water governance since Part of the paper is clearly built on our experience through and exchanges through the water governance initiative. So let me develop a bit these three aspects very briefly. Uh, first, uh, policy implementation gaps. We try to identify what we consider the main policy uh, implementation gaps and also their causes. I'm not going to go to go through all this. I have pointed out what I want to emphasize briefly. Uh, we identify four sets of uh, gaps. Uh, first, the gaps in policy formulation process. Uh, second, the gaps in operationalization of the policy. Third, gaps that are related to characteristic and behavior of stakeholders. Uh, and fourth, the gaps related to the governance situation of the specific countries that we are working on in our different projects. And for each of them, we try to connect to causes that could explain these gaps. For example, in policy formulation, uh, I emphasize two here, lack of high level political commitment, lack of participation by stakeholders. And we connected that to uh, the principles that have been developed uh, in the OECD document. The same for the four uh, items. Um, in doing that, we put some emphasis on the institutional uh, aspect or the institutional dimension of these gaps. We connected these gaps to institutional dimensions, taking uh, on board uh, recent developments in institutional analysis. For a long time, when people referred to institutions, it was pretty vague. They would refer basically to 
what we now call the macro institutions, that is, you know, the, the role of the parliament, the laws that have been implemented and so forth. And progressively, it became very obvious for researchers working not only on research projects, but also uh, in the field, that there are other layers that really matter a lot. Uh, uh, between and particularly a layer that is linking the macro level where the policies are elaborated and decided and the level where operators or users are actually uh, working within these framework but there's a missing link here and we tried in the paper to develop that missing link through that concept that has been developed over the last years in people uh, among people working on institutions which is very often identified as intermediate or the meso institutional layer uh, because we think that uh, a lot of the gaps that we have identified are at that level and we connected that level that uh, layer of meso institutions which is where the rules of the game so to speak are developed translated into specific rules implemented, monitored by uh, specific institutions. And we've, didn't, we've tried in the paper to also point out, uh, the nice table is from uh, Alejandro, by the way, uh, we, we, we try to, to connect that with the different levels of administration and possibly also the geographical dimension at which, at which these different institutions operate. Why uh, this concept of meso institutions in a few words and why to focus on it? Well, in relation to the principle on governance, we, we thought that it's necessary to embed the governance issue uh, into the institutional environment. Uh, governance is developing and facing challenges and dealing with problems that are partially coming from the institutional environment. Now, there's a lot of literature on the institutional environment, but again, as I said before, it has remained for a long time at a very general and abstract level. And what we tried to do in the paper is to show that, based on recent contribution of the literature, this issue of governance can be embedded in very specific set of institutions, the one that I've mentioned before. And that allows to integrate the issue of governance into a general model of institutions, but with a relatively refined model in that there are different institutional layers involved from the micro level at which operators and users are working to the general level of the laws and regulation that are adopted. But in between, there's a lot happening. And actually, we we emphasize in the in the paper that and we give example that uh, in many many cases it's where most action is actually happening at that intermediate level like in regulatory board municipal authorities uh, uh, communities uh, committees and so forth that are linking the general rules with the specific situations where they have to operate and the last uh, aspect that for perspective from our perspective it's important uh, is important but also uh, it's, I think important for the purpose of that special issue and more generally what has been done at the OECD is that we connect these gaps these problems with uh, specific uh, principles that have been developed in the principles on water go governance so this table here and the slides I understood from uh, Scott uh, will be available to all of you uh, this specific and the paper also so these specific gaps are connected to specific uh, principles uh, like the policy formulation process well it clearly connects to the promotion uh, of stakeholder engagement or the absence of stakeholder engagement which then create a problem in the implementation of policies the same when it comes to uh, the operationalization of uh, the policy well, how is it make operational uh, well, what are the institu specific institutions that can promote a regular monitoring and evaluation of water policy and that are supporting and making sustainable the governance uh, or making not sustainable uh, collapsing? The same for the, other, for the other gaps. I don't want to enter into 
too many details, but you can see that it connects a lot with the different uh, principles that have been elaborated progressively in that uh, water governance initiatives. So to conclude, to make it as short as possible, because I think that in this web seminar, webinar, uh, what, me, what matters is the discussion and the question, is that uh, we have tried to show that identifying the gap is very important, but enough, it's not enough. Uh, because the gaps refer to the difficulties of governance that has been pointed out before and fill, filling these gaps is really hard work. Uh, part of that uh, difficulty comes that very often the governance is, is failing because there's no adequate institutions. But build, building an adequate institutional environment is a long-term goal, particularly if you look only at the general level. And very often, if you focus too much at the general level, uh, like changing the law or implementing new rules of the game, uh, it doesn't have an impact in the field, on the field. Uh, and that's why we, folk, we think that the attention should focus much more on the appropriate institutional level, which is really these meso institutions that are central to reform governance. So read the paper, read the principles, and make it happen. This is it. Well, that's a call to arms if I ever heard one. So go out there and read the paper. Get a cold copy of it and uh, put it into action. No, I really want to thank you, Claude. That was a great presentation. And I thought it really highlighted, uh, I mean, as you point out, but I mean, it highlights a really overlooked aspect of water governance of one of the major institutional actors um, that people just sort of aim right for the top when they talk about things, you know, well, it's the United Nations this, or they aim straight at the bottom and they say, well, look who's, who's implementing things right there in the community. But they kind of miss out on this sort of mid-level this mezzo level you speak of and um, I think that's really important and thank you so much for having this um, bringing this to our attention and to really connecting that through to how the um, OECD water governance principles are set up and um, how they're addressing so thank you so much for that presentation that was really great um, our next presenter is going to be Susan Neto from the University of Lisbon so Susanna the floor is yours thank you very much Scott and uh, first of all, thank you very much to OECD, um, Aziza and uh, Delphine along the process for the hard work and uh, preparing all this, um, this, sorry, I'm just uh, sharing the screen now. I hope it's okay. Looks great. Okay, thank you. So um, I want to, first of all, thank uh, OECD and uh, um, IWRR for organizing this, uh, this webinar on the papers. It was really a great opportunity to get together all the other nine co-authors uh, to realize this, uh, this analysis. And it is now also a very nice opportunity to meet the other uh, articles and the other works and find uh, many links uh, surely with uh, with others that uh, I would like to uh, explore in the future. I will also thank all the the colleagues that uh, went uh, accepted to go on in this adventure with me and from different parts of the world. We tried to um, get diversity not only in our analysis but also in the group of people that were undertaking it. So, first of all, this article uh, explores a selection of six water uh, governance frameworks. And what we try to do is uh, al al align this, uh, the principles that are behind these uh, frameworks with the 12 principles of uh, OECD and find out if the what is going on, on under these policies has or not uh, something to do with the same principles and the same philosophy that um, uh, is behind these 12 main <coughs> principles. We examine so these uh, frameworks uh, trying to have different contexts and different focus. We went uh, from Australia to Brazil, New Zealand, Europe, in, in national uh, water policy frameworks, but also 
included um, a transnational water policy framework, that is the Water Framework Directive in Europe, and a global guideline, that is the Lisbon Charter, what, uh, which uh, allowed us to spread our uh, scope of analysis. Uh, these frameworks have also different focus. Uh, so we have from uh, the Water Framework Directive that uh, wants to establish or re-establish ecological integrity to Brazil, where the main um, focus of uh, the reform, water reform has to be uh, had to be uh, the democratizing uh, water management system. There are also diversity uh, in approaches. We try to uh, get together the approach from water resources and the approach from water services. And we had different uh, representations of this the differentiation and uh, one of our cases was uh, addressing both like uh, that is the case of South Africa, for example. So one thing that uh, I would like to make very clear is that we were not comparing the, these frameworks with each other. We were just comparing their performance against the 12 OECD principles and doing that, we wanted to understand what were the main uh, problems, the main gaps, uh, uh, connecting a bit with uh, with uh, what Claude was saying. And uh, fr doing that exercise, we, we could also uh, extract some recommendations and some ideas for what would be necessary to improve <laughs> some of these gaps in the implementation of the 12 principles as well. We know this cluster, as Isa just showed it, we um, built an assessment criteria to analyze and go through all these frameworks. We decided to uh, take alignment, implementation, on-ground results, and policy results. Um, and then we uh, went through all the, the different frameworks and used um, the experience and the knowledge of all our co-authors being in the position they could they could uh, have to analyze and assess uh, the the specific frameworks for each of the regions, countries, or the transnational ones. This is just an example of uh, the, the table that we filled for the 12 principles going across the all these six frame, water frameworks and giving some Quanti quantitative uh, points to each of the criteria, aligning, implementing on-ground results or the impact of, of the policies. Of course, the I will not go through many, many details. I will just show how we did this in, uh, for each of the principles. So we could see, for example, and I will just read the first one because I have in the slides all the 12 and they will be accessible to everybody. For example, for clear roles and, and responsibilities, there is strong or full alignment between the principles and all the frameworks. From, uh, but if we go to on-ground results, then the, this, this uh, quantification or assessment, of course, starts to be much lower and much more uh, difficult to, to achieve. So we have this exercise for the 12 principles. And this table can show us a bit of a synthesis of our, of our results. We have on the left side the highest scoring principles from the 12. So going through all the frameworks, we see that uh, stakeholder engagement or regulatory frameworks are very strongly um, addressed by all the different uh, frameworks that we analyzed. And on the right side, and this is probably most useful and rich in, our, in, our, in the results that we found, we can see that uh, policy coherence is one principle that scored lower in all four uh, criteria. And it's interesting because I saw that one of the gaps that Claude um, pointed in his table was exactly policy coherence as well. Transparency is another one. 
and uh, we have also the financing and uh, managing trade-offs that are are sorry are to give us some uh, ask some demand some attention so what we did was going through these four problematic principles as we could say problematic in terms of why is it difficult to implement them in the different frameworks and we undertook then a qualitative analysis across the different frameworks and the discussing between all of us with the objective of identifying the factors that were needing future action in these four target areas so principle three uh policy coherence financing managing trade-offs and integrity and transparency and for example for the first one principle three we went through the analysis of what it states and what are the ways to address the implementation of this principle by oecd and what could be the reasons for not having this uh, principle so well scored in the six frameworks so we did this analysis in inside each of the frameworks and we have this analysis and the conclusion and the main conclusion reading only the big words is probably there is a need for innovative governance methods that better align policy objectives with values consistently across levels and scales so while we have multi-level governance as a clear goal this doesn't happen automatically and there's a work of this innovative uh, governance that goes across the different levels and the different uh, scales for principle six and the uh, allocation of financial resources to be efficient and seeing all the recommendations of oecd to implement this principle doing this analysis across the six frameworks we could uh, understand that to help address this financing should be focused on more comprehensive water management integrating water resource and infrastructure planning having uh, uh, not this integration uh, beforehand and along the whole process probably doesn't help implement this principle Talking about trade-offs across water users, the principle 11, we understood that earlier investment in capacity building towards preparedness and adaptation skills are also very important to help address this objective. So, and last, uh, uh, regarding uh, the OECD principle nine, integrity and transparency. We know that uh, increasing governmental commitment to longer term goals and uh, formulating long lasting policies takes time takes a lot of effort and takes a lot of communicating or uh, more clear communication with citizens about the objectives the measures everything that is necessary to be done and these processes uh, seeing all the six frameworks are usually left to uh, not so deep communication the the systems of communication all the aims and goals of different policies or changes in policies are usually not so well undertaken <coughs> in this way so what we tried also to do regarding uh, this analysis besides understanding which principles were needing some more attention inside looking inside all these different uh, frameworks diverse in context in focus and in regional regional um, location we tried in the end of course uh, all the work that is in the in the paper that was published is not in the in the slides but it will be accessible to everybody through the the publication uh, we tried to also draw some general conclusions and final recommendations uh, towards this trilogy of effectiveness, efficiency, and trust and engagement that cluster all the other 12 principles. And reading only the 
had the, the big uh, words here again. We recommend in the end of our paper that there should be re a reinforcement of comprehensive approach to water management, of the holistic approach, integrative approach, integrating different dimensions, anticipating and having a, um, a longer cycle um, in, in all the processes is necessary. Uh, the second one is strengthening transboundary co cooperation. This is really very important in many regions of the world, and the OECD principles are not very clearly addressing this issue. And probably one of the possibilities could be connecting more with the uh, uh, conventions of Helsinki and uh, New York to understand how this could be improved. The third one is filling the gap for weak national water policies. There are many countries where the water policy is not so strong and maybe the OECD principles can become a uh, real support for these, uh, these countries to help uh, to build more strong um, policy frameworks and regulatory frameworks. The fourth one is funding the whole water cycle thinking of the finances from the upstream uh, logic to the downstream and not only focusing on scattered interventions. Five is networking around good practices, which is the work that the Water Governance Initiative Group is doing and providing uh, very interesting and important, useful information. And the sixth is national integrity and guidance with locally default decisions. Having more transparency also demands that there is more local awareness of what is being done at all the levels, institutional levels. Uh, and it was very interesting to see what Claude presented. And it's, it's really important to discuss all these institutional um, gaps. And um, so this was the, the appendix just uh, for curiosity showing the scoring results for each framework that will be accessible also in the presentation and of course there were other materials in the publication that uh, i hope that people can um, have access later so thank you again i hope uh, this gave some light on what we tried to do it was an ambitious uh, exercise it was a starting point and uh, we we all hope all all the 10 authors hope to continue it and uh, maybe this webinar can be a good uh, possibility and platform to go on and explore more ideas thank you well thank you so much for that presentation susanna that was really great and one of the things i really enjoyed about it was that you took a very quantitative approach to breaking down this research. Um, you know, a lot of times in water governance, we take a lot more of a qualitative approach, which is very valuable and useful. But this just laid things out nicely and simply in numbers and allowed a little bit more, I thought, you know, crunching to come out from a different standpoint. I think it's good. You don't want the qualitative or just the quantitative, but to bring it together and have that kind of mixed methods research, which I think can be really helpful and really informative. And uh, so thank you for doing that. And that takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of energy, I know, to go through and score all that research and say, is this a three, is this a four? What's my rubric look like? So thank you for doing that. And I think yeah. you came out with some really great um, recommendations as well. So thank you for that. Um, thank you. Our next presenter is Uta Wynn uh, from uh, IG Delft. Yes, I need your help with uh, authorizing me to share the screen. Yes, here we go. There you go. Yeah, there we go. Right, if all works well, then you can see my screen well. It looks great. I just need to move you out of the way because I'd also like to see my slides, so don't mind. So uh, thank you very much, Scott. And I would like to join the previous speakers in thanking IWA and the OECD for making this entire journey uh, possible, as, uh, as Isa already mentioned, from the production of the special issue now to the webinar. This is very much appreciated. Um, and in the same vein, I would also like to thank my co-authors who are both from, from academia, from uh, colleagues from IGE Delft, but also from the Open University in the UK. 
as well as uh, a key stakeholder in water governance, namely uh, the youth, represented here by the Water Youth Network. And for us, it has also been a very interesting exercise to produce this paper together to bring our different experiences and conceptual understandings together. So we're focusing on stakeholder engagement in water governance as social learning, and we would like to share in this paper our lessons from practice. So we saw the rich uh, principles on water governance uh, that Aziza introduced earlier. Uh, it is, of course, a, a very rich set uh, based on, on a lot of uh, existing knowledge and experience in the field uh, with, produced jointly with many stakeholders. Um, so in our uh, paper, we actually zoom in precisely on one principle, the stakeholder engagement. Principle number 10, which uh, specifically reads to promote stakeholder engagement for informed and outcome-oriented contributions to water policy design and implementation. Um, we are aware that not only the principles on water governance ask for our stakeholder engagement, but we also have uh, long-standing international regimes, the Aarhus Convention, the Dublin Principle, principles for integrated water resources management. But what we also see um, uh, in, in, in uh, academia, but also in practice, is that the importance given to stakeholder engagement varies in actual implementation, how stakeholder engagement is actually interpreted by different stakeholders, but also the extent to which it's actually implemented in practice uh, leaves much to be desired. So we saw um, a common theme here for, for the different co-authors where we have contributions to make. And so in the paper, in a nutshell, we focus on what does stakeholder engagement now actually mean and how can it actually deliver in practice in the context of water governance uh, beyond being a principle. We use a particular lens here, namely uh, social learning and participation and decision making that we use to, to analyze our ex respective experiences. And then we reflect on different modalities for engagement uh, in three different fields of water governance and see how uh, engagement of dis dis distinct stakeholders uh, actually took place and what lessons we can learn from that. So what are these three fields of water governance that we focus on? The first one deals with water quality in the context of the Water Framework Directive, specifically the catchment-based approach uh, practiced in uh, England, in the UK, to fill the policy practice gap, yet another gap, lots of gaps uh, today in the, in the, in the webinar. Um, but the particular gap that's referred to here and that's explored uh, and that was initiated by the Department for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs to fix was the Water Framework Directive uh, uh, focuses on the individual water body, but actual management is done at basin or even at catchment level. So uh, uh, the uh, department had set up a whole network of more than 100 catchments, and it's within that context of bringing policymakers and practitioners managing those catchments together that we have one case study. So the catchment-based approach for the Water Framework Directive is the first case study. The second one are a number of the Water Youth Network's water projects. Um, they themselves represent uh, uh, one of the underrepresented groups in, in water governance, but they also explored um, other uh, uh, unrepresented groups, homeless, local communities, and explored in a num across a number of projects uh, water security at different levels, both in Europe and in a particular case in Kenya. The last case uh, that we uh, explored here in this paper is the Recensed Citizen Observatories case. Um, uh, citizen Observatories are means to capture, let's say, the wisdom of the crowd by using information communication technologies to ideally establish a two-way communications paradigm between the public, citizens, and authorities or policymakers. Um, here in the Recensed project, we had uh, case studies in the UK, Netherlands, and Italy, <coughs> and we explored how uh, innovative ICTs can actually be used for stakeholder engagement uh, in this context. So this was not primary research that we did for this paper, but we had already done research in each of the cases and documented that. So we, we drew on this to do a secondary analysis and a cross analysis across all three cases. So social learning, what does it mean and what is it actually, why are we bringing this into context here? Um, it comes back to my introduction of saying, well, stakeholder engagement in principle, well, it is a principle, it's a principle of the um, water governance principles uh, and in other regimes, but, you know, often it's a, it's a 
kind of tick the box kind of activity. So here with, with the focus on social learning, we wanted to move away from those procedural niceties for certain authorities to be able to say, yes, I've done it and then can I move on? I've invited some people and asked for their feedback to say, we need to look much deeper and really unpack this process. So social learning is understood as an emerging mechanism to promote concerted action among stakeholders, which is very different from just inviting members of the public to be able to say um, that st stakeholder engagement has been done. And specifically, we um, in the paper elaborate uh, the literature in this and, and distill from it this a number of aspects uh, that one or more of these aspects we consider as, as, as key for social learning. So one is the conversions as, as goals expressed as particular purpose of the, of the entire process. The second is the process of knowledge co-creation. So again, it goes beyond mere invitation of stakeholders, but understanding the situation better, providing insights into the causes of the situation that we are given within a specific water governance context, and then also understanding of how we can get out of it. What are the means of possible transformation? Thirdly, are changes in behavior and also actions resulting from the new understanding. And fourth is the emergent property of the process to actually transform the situation. So these are the four elements of social learning that we let loose on our respective cases uh, to distill lessons from each of the cases and then to see what, what lessons we can actually learn across the three cases. So not all lessons are represented in all three cases, but we nevertheless think that these are um, salient lessons to be learned. Perhaps the first one is an open door. So yes, social learning takes time. So if any time we are aiming for behavioral change, social learning contexts are no different, it takes time uh, for people to learn and adapt their behavior and uh, change their actions. Secondly, ensuring that all stakeholders have access to the same information um, in itself, that's an elaborate process. Um, it also refers to agreeing, agreeing on where, where are the boundaries of the particular governance issue that we are discussing. But we saw in the, in certainly in, in the uh, Water Youth Network cases, but also in the recensed cases, the power it had once local stakeholders had an idea of what data fed into decision-making processes, once they had better information to be a more informed participant in the process uh, was incredibly powerful. Uh, thirdly, stakeholder involvement is not only understanding the responsibilities in terms of mapping the decision-making processes as, as the principle also stipulates, but we need to go one level deeper. We need to look at really what are the drivers, what are different stakeholders getting out of this process or what are certain dangers developing here. We saw this very clearly in the recensed cases where the introduction of ICTs suddenly changes dynamics between stakeholders and authorities not only had new ears and eyes on the ground in the form of citizens feeding in uh, collections on, uh, on flood incidents, um, but they were also given new responsibilities of responding to, uh, to measurements uh, shared in social media and in the online environment, giving entirely new responsibilities to authorities that they were not necessarily waiting for. Um, fourthly, the inclusion of underrepresented groups. Again, the principle is quite explicit on this, but actually what we see is that, we re that it requires a structured stakeholder engagement approach. Um, this certainly is an insight that applies to water governance as much as to the broader sustainable development goals. It's not something that we can expect to happen automatically. In fact, particularly when we, when we see that often uh, the involvement of youth, of youth is seen as risk because it delays the process and they don't know it enough and they don't understand enough, rather than an added value stresses the point that actually specific efforts need to be paid, uh, made here to include youth as a stakeholder and other rep underrepresented groups. Um, finally here, the um, stakeholder engagement, we see it as an ongoing dynamic. So it's a process that is there to foster the collective learning beyond the individual's uh, uh, improved understanding, collective learning on the one hand, cooperation among stakeholders on the other hand, and not for the sake of it, although that's of course very good, but in order to trigger uh, a sustainable transformation and change out of the, the initial issue situation that the stakeholders find themselves in. So to wrap up with uh, a small set of conclusions, 
in our paper, we make the case to say, let's look at social learning as a means of reframing stakeholder engagement, unpacking the norms and, and principles here to really say, how can we turn this into a proactive uh, uh, process with, with uh, useful outcomes? And therefore, the key question that we argue should be asked is stakeholder engagement, of course, not for the sake of it, but for what purpose? What is the particular purpose in a given governance issue? So it's not to tick boxes, it's not only uh, public participation, it goes way beyond that. We, we see it as uh, an opportunity for multi-stakeholder interaction, multi-stakeholder dialogue and multi-stakeholder learning. So again, beyond the individual learning. Um, it certainly requires more than a top-down decision-making process to succeed. We, we uh, share in the paper a number of uh, um, lessons from the, from the different cases where um, it's not enough to to open the gate and say here's the process um, and people will not just simply flog in there's quite some effort involved uh, so and then trust is both a requisite and an outcome of the process and so um, this brings us to to the fact that we can't just demand trust as a principle to exist we need to shape uh, governance processes and particularly stakeholder engagement processes such that trust can evolve and provide a continuous basis. So here I would like to leave it like uh, Claude, I'd also like to encourage you to, to read the paper. It's available uh, as an open access paper. And I will also not miss this opportunity to flag a number of the ongoing projects of my team that where we are exploring um, the role of ICTs in water governance in stakeholder engagement, also particularly empowering women and uh, other underrepresented groups. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that presentation, Uta. That was great. And I thought it really was a nice, interesting way to start thinking about and changing our thinking about the questions around public participation. Um, so often, you know, we just kind of say public participation, we need some. But what does that really mean? Like you said, it's not just a process of ticking boxes and it's not just a process of saying, well, you know, we had a forum and no one showed up. So, you know, or these are the people who showed up and this is the, the viewpoints they gave. And then that's all we really care about and, and move on. But about how to kind of engage people into sort of have a, a dialogue really and then also i thought it was important to bring out and talk about the groups that weren't being represented like the youth um uh, who are obviously uh future generations so you know making it a good investment there with their social learning will pay dividends in the future so thank you so much for that i thought it was a really great presentation um where final presentation is going to come from pierre allen and um, I'd like to remind anyone that we'll have questions right after Pierre Allen's uh, presentation. So right there in the question box, um, which should be about a second from the bottom for you. Uh, just go ahead and type it in, I'll see them, and then I can kind of try to uh, get as many questions in as we have time for. So thank you so much for tuning in today, and here's our last presentation with Pierre Allen. Okay, uh, hello everybody. I hope you hear me correctly. I understand that I will have to be a bit shorter because of uh, time is running and uh, we need time for for questions. Is uh, I first uh, want to to thank you for all the the work that has been done together, as I'm involved in water governance initiatives for. For, from the beginning and directly involved in the indicator process uh, for the last years. And so I think that uh, all the case studies that has been gathered are very, very interesting uh, for us. I also want to thank uh, our co-authors that are more uh, academics that I am, Marine Colomb and Sophie Richard. Uh, and we try to have a, a look on uh, water governance in France uh, for uh, 50 years, as, as the question of long term uh, evaluation. Looks like Pierre Allen's having just a little bit of a connection problem. We were worried about that. Um, Pierre Allen, can you hear us? Pierre? Hmm. W why don't you try turning off your, your webcam there and see, see if that helps?
Pierre, can you hear us? Are you still there with us, Pierre? Well, tell you what, let's go to a question until we get Pierre coming back. All right, we'll, we'll have a, let, let, let's hear. Um, you got a question all keyed up here. Okay, how would the panel like to think about when relating the OECD water governance principles to the leading EU uh, water framework directive principles, there is a bit of a mismatch in the sense that um, some of the OECD principles might be considered uh, insignificant or irrelevant. Um, does the panel agree with this observation? And um, if so, why do you think this is? This is a question that comes from uh, one of our viewers today. Um, Sindri Lagras. So, panel, uh, what do you what do you think of this? Anyone can just uh, unmute your microphone and, and uh, let us know. Um, I can I can uh, hand the microphone. Um, can you, you uh, just clarify? The question was about uh, having some mismatching or overlapping between uh, the principles and the water framework directive. They, they thought there was a disjunction, I guess, between the two, and that, that maybe the, the EU Water Framework Directive wasn't speaking to the OE, the same concerns to the OECD water governance uh, uh, principles, and that maybe they're sort of minimizing the importance of some of the things that we saw through the OECD process. Well, I, uh, in my opinion, I think that there are two different, very different contexts where the principles appeared and the Water Framework Directive appeared. Uh, the WFD uh, was targeting main, ma mainly the integrity of uh, the water, the aquatic ecosystems and the water systems, and uh, tried to integrate all the legal uh, scattered frameworks or directives that existed before towards water quality and giving it an ecological label of good status of all water bodies in Europe and uh, was also including for the first time in water policy the dimensions uh, besides this environmental and ecological integrating the social participation and economic dimension with the recovery of costs. So it was uh, approved in 2000, it was uh, before the, the, the principles uh, of, of OECD. It's a different, uh, it's a different kind of background and uh, principles and uh, philosophy but the water framework directive needs to evolve as well and it's, it's it's going to be reviewed now in this year next year so there will be uh, an opportunity to consider other dimensions that probably were uh, overlooked in in the in the directive as well i think it's it's always good to raise this question and uh, it was a good question Excellent. Thank you. I think some of our others would like to respond. The muting is on your side, so go ahead and, and um, make sure you click the presenters. Um, I know the OECD office would like to, to weigh in. Yes. I can come back if possible. Okay, uh, Pierre, let's, let's finish this question and then we'll, we'll go ahead and um, get to, to um, your presentation just as soon as we finish this question, but I, I, I want to hear from the OECD water governance team. Um, but the, the muting is on, on your side, guys, I think. Uh, I, I didn't I didn't mute you. There you go. Can you hear me? No, no, okay. <laughs> Uh, okay. Just two quick, uh, two quick words uh, to build on what Susanna said. Uh, we're talking about two different things uh, in terms of scope, uh, in terms of timeline. But that's indeed a discussion uh, that we had when it came uh, to the intergovernmental process uh, behind the principles, because as many of you know, two-thirds of OECD countries are EU countries. 
And therefore, uh, you had not only to provide for something that would be a common denominator and sufficiently ambitious for those EU countries that had already uh, somewhat their governance uh, structures uh, boosted or incentivized by a regulatory framework uh, uh, by, uh, coming from the Commission uh, 15 years ago, uh, but also to the non-EU countries of the OECD that were not necessarily subject to the same regulations. And when you come to some of the principles, like principle two on base and scale, for example, that's a very uh, concrete example of how you can have different approaches, whether you are or not within the EU context and subject to the Water Framework Directive, where there has been a lot more prescriptive uh, uh, guidance, I would say, about the base in scale, which is not necessarily the case in, in countries like Korea, for example, uh, that is also a member country. So I wouldn't say it's irrelevant. I would say this is a common denominator to both countries that have already been subject to an overarching re um, regulation beyond their boundaries and countries that have not uh, and, and, and partly uh, resulted in, in different uh, governance responses. So, uh, and in addition to the fact that many of the principles indeed are not captured by the directive itself, because here we're looking typically at the, at the governance. So it's interesting to see that, that I'll, I'll conclude with that in, in the ongoing EU reflections about the stock taking from 17 years of the Water Framework Directive, there's a very big emphasis on governance because there is now an understanding that if we have not restored the the ecological status of water bodies to the extent we wanted, that's also because there have been a number of governance bottlenecks in countries. So it's uh, interesting to see how uh, this part of the implementation gaps is, is gaining traction in the EU setting as well. Excellent. Well, thank you for that. Um, does anyone else on the panel want to weigh in or should we try to go again to Pierre Allen's uh, presentation? Can you hear me? Yep, now we can. I'll make a very brief comment. Um, it's an interesting question, but I think also it's suggesting that we should compare apples and pears. The principles are generic in nature. The Water Framework Directive is specific policy that we could measure against the principles and then compare to what extent, you know, the Water Framework Directive actually uh, represents the various principles, etc. But it's it's not a one-on-one -on -one comparison. It's more it's a benchmark. It's, it's a guidance. For, for devising good policy. So indeed in the revision, it should be taken into account. That's a good observation, thank you. Okay, let's let's try it. Pierre Allen, are you still with us there? You're just kind of a blur on my screen, to be honest. Okay, oh, I lost him again. It's okay, there's other questions. We'll go to other questions. Um, okay, here's a question. Have there been studies that have tried to measure the governance performance for actual water management cases at any level for all of the 12 primary dimensions uh, grouped, grouped by the three categories um, of these principles? Um, and what was the methodology uh, of, if any of those were conducted? Or has have these not yet come together? Maybe a forthcoming study opportunities for some academics. Should I start? <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Um, actually, the report we're launching in Brasilia, um, which is called Implementation of the OECD Principles, Indicator Framework and Evolving Practices, has a full chapter that is providing the concrete uh, illustrations of how the principles have been used over the past three years, including as an assessment uh, reading template in some of the countries. So you have there a bit of a, based on a survey on those who have actually endorsed, there may be a lot of things that we don't know, and, and the objective is precisely that they be used outside the OECD and by other stakeholders and the OECD, but, but you have there a bit of a glance of what we could uh, identify uh, from the stakeholders we've been working with. Now, as the OECD, when we do country-specific dialogues, uh, whereby we assess the, the, the level of water risks and whether the governance system is equipped or not uh, to manage these risks. We now use systematically the principles as a, as a guiding framework to do so. So we did it recently uh, with Brazil uh, and
and, and the report is available online. We're starting soon with Peru. So there are a number of countries where we're being asked to support reform processes and where this is indeed our, our, our guiding framework. Excellent. Well, that's great. It's kind of a preview of what will be, what'll be coming on soon. Uh, Claude, what? Okay, unmute your microphone, Claude. Can't can't hear you. There, there, try again. There you go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> Let me just add very briefly that uh, part of the problem for testing empirically, which is the question, uh, the principles, is that we need indicators. And this is precisely what the OECD is, is trying to develop now. I, my understanding is that they will be available very soon. So that's one observation I wanted to make. Another observation is that based on the principle, I'm involved in an ongoing project with the National University of Singapore, where we're testing part of the principles on eight, eight Asian, uh, Asian cities. It's an ongoing research project, but we have collected the information and now we're processing. But yeah, we need to go further with the help of the indicators that have been elaborated and that will be made available hopefully very soon. Excellent. Well, does anyone else have uh, anything to, to add to that? Um, I think it kind of segues to maybe our next question. Um, and this is this is directly for uh, Susanna, but I think that we can kind of maybe apply it more broadly. Um, our, our question is that um, in selecting the six frameworks, uh, it was done taking account of the context and scope. But what was the basis of choosing these particular frameworks and not others? And I think that kind of asks a question also just about methodology for each of you. You know, how how did you select? You know, what went into your studies? What went out? You know, what, what do you choose? And so you know, kind of. You're talking, Claude, with the uh, indicators. You know, how do we pick these indicators? How do we decide? And, and you know, I guess when we're looking at doing, you know, applying this to all countries, but you know, how do we decide which countries we start with? Yes. Well, there was a mix of uh, reasons and factors. First of all, the the need to have a diversity. Uh, we also got together a group of uh, very experienced uh, researchers and uh, practitioners from different uh, countries and we were thinking about uh, um, a set that could be representative in terms of uh, what a governance reforms from one side at the national level. We also wanted to have some transnational experience and the Water Framework Directive was obviously a good choice and we had also uh, the idea of uh, talking about integrating services and resources and so the Lisbon Charter was one possibility of doing that knowing that also in the South Africa the approach of the water reform integrates these two uh, dimensions. Uh, so we based our uh, assessment using this Likert scale so we were based on the experience and knowledge of our authors to analyze because they were well positioned in each of the, the frameworks to be able to analyze and take uh, conclusions and be able to make this quantitative assessment using a, a adapting a Likert scale to, to this um, examination. So we tried to, of course, we cannot say that this exhausted all the possibilities, but we, um, we, we were choosing a good representative sample of water reforms that uh, could bring some richness to this um, assessment uh, against the, the OECD principles. Okay, thank you. Can, does anyone else want to weigh in with their kind of observations about how they assembled their methodology? Yeah, if I, if I may, Scott, um, for, for um, us, it was initially uh, three separate submissions, three separate abstracts, but we um, had the overlap and the thematic focus on the stakeholder engagement. So one of the principles, not across the board, but focusing on one particular uh, principle. And there, of course, uh, the scientific committee uh, for the special issue was well placed to see this alignment and put us together. Uh, and then we went through a process of 
um, explaining to each other what we had, what we, what case studies we had at hand. Uh, we also had to exclude one co-author because we couldn't make it fit. Um, but then we uh, developed uh, the framework of uh, social learning together uh, as as a common framework to be applied in all three things. Um, ours is not a quantitative study at all. Uh, we haven't tried to code uh, the, the insights by, by the respective authors. It's a qualitative study, but we have also developed a matrix that's in the paper that shows, according to the different dimensions of social learning that we have developed, what the specific case-specific findings are and how we can draw lessons from that. Excellent. Would anyone else on the panel like to... Could I add something? Yes, please do. Yes. Uh, when we tried uh, to, to bring the indicators, uh, we, we had an idea that uh, was very, very interesting. I think that uh, we need to reflect not only the appraisal, uh, the collective appraisal uh, assessment of the situation, but also the discrepan discrepancies between stakeholders in their way of thinking about the, the status of the situation is. That is, we described uh, in the group that have been gathered that some could think that the, the, the situation is correct and some other can consider that it's not satisfactory. And the recognition of these different point of views are very good to show the hot spots, the, the, the hot questions that have to be resolved. So we not only assess collectively, but also we consider the differences between stakeholders in their assessment of the situation of the water governance. Okay, excellent, excellent. So, sorry we lost you there, Claude, uh, Pierre. Um, uh, you know, we have about nine minutes left in, in the presentation, so maybe what we can do, or in the webinar, so maybe what we can do is just um, to put your um, PowerPoints on the website. Yes, no problem. And people can review that um, and follow up with mm -hmm. you later. Uh, well, sorry, you couldn't quite get the technology working on um, Yeah, yes. Very good. And, um, uh, I apologize for the difficulties. No, it's no problem at all. And it, please jump in on any of these questions. It's a little hard. We can't quite see when you're ready to, to jump in, but we'll hear your voice and we'll, we'll give you a space. Um, one of the next question is, um, do people feel that all the principles outlined here are equally important in all the different water challenge contexts, such as water quantity, water quality, water allocation, irrigation, or are there some principles that are more or less important in different types of contexts? Uh, Aziza, maybe do you have some, some as kind of one of the... So one of the questions we asked in the in the survey to res uh, respondents about how they've been using them is is whether they they focused on some specific principles when dealing with specific water management functions like drinking water, uh, wastewater management, flood uh, risk management, and so on, or whether they use the package to look at the full cycle. And actually, it's uh, mostly the package, although in some cases there has been a, a selective approach uh, to uh, discuss more directly areas that are more problematic in the context that, uh, that uh, they use the principles for. So uh, that's one thing. Having said that, what we have done uh, as OECD Secretariat is to apply the principles to two specific um, uh, uh, sectors. Uh, one is to floods, and we have actually a working paper that is coming, um, which is based on, on a number of case studies, and that is providing for a sort of checklist that is uh, specific to the situations of floods uh, uh, against the 12 principles, and to the uh, groundwater uh, resources uh, aspects because there's a lot there that is invisible and that the principle can help uh, make visible. So we, we've done these uh, specific applications to see 
uh, whether there are really differences or, or things that require more emphasis. And so these, these additional two pieces, I hope, can uh, can contribute. But but it's probably to countries and, and cities and, and basins to uh, tell us in, in the way they use methodologically the principles as a tool for dialogue, whether they've come up with things that are more prominent than, than others. Can I add something? Yeah, please yeah. do. Yeah, yeah. I think that uh, the principles are defining a f sort of analytical framework to assess different situations. But of course, depending on the institutional environment, uh, some principles may matter more than others, but not necessarily always where you expect. For example, let me give you an example. For example, the role of stakeholders. Well, there are some countries or some regions where the role of stakeholders is already taken on board and play an important role and there are other countries where it's not the case and you have some surprise for example in in, in singapore which is a very developed system water uh, system uh, basically stakeholders have no word to say so you know i think that different aspects of the principles and light or shed light on some aspects of policy that are not the same everywhere and that provides a good element of comparison also which is important to assess situation that's a good observation thank you that's really good uh pierre do you have anything to, to contribute there i can't can't see yeah thank you uh two, two things the first one is that uh, uh governance is, is a way to, to solve conflicts and to find solution when uh, new new items new concerns arise and the way we can assess the quality of governance is a, a dynamic way how can they uh, answer new questions and non, non only to answer questions that have been uh, given and uh, discussed uh, five years ago ten years ago and this ability to uh, to to face to new challenges is very important it's the first point and i think that the principle reflects it uh, correct the second one is that uh, we have some overlap between the principle it, we cannot uh, have such a fragmented analytical view that each principle is completely independent of the others and when we have built all the indicator frameworks we had difficulties to uh, to organize it as a non-overlapping way of assessing the tools we try to do our best with the pilot <clears throat> test to avoid the main discrepancies the main overlaps but in fact we don't have to be perfectly analytical in such a way we have to be very flexible because in some cases one of the principle is considered in some indicators are very important and uh, we cannot reflect it in another principle but in fact it's present also thank you which is what Suzanne has shown in, in their their yeah, ratings. yeah exactly exactly Uta and Susanna, did you have anything to contribute on that? Yes. Uh, just uh, very quickly, I was uh, agreeing with uh, both uh, Pierre and Claude uh, this uh, analytical framework, but it's not a static one. It can be whatever you like, and it's a dynamic. So it's not only a question of uh, different contexts, but different timings. In the same context, a principle can be more important in a different time. And so it, it has some. Uh, and dynamism that we have to consider and uh, that's the only thing I would add for now. Uta? Yeah, I just perhaps as a final point to add that indeed we can make the framework uh, uh, be what we want it to be. We can have it as, either as an analytical framework and fairly neutral, of, the, of course the total neutrality and, and complete knowledge is not possible to bring into it. Um, by definition, or we can use it as a normative framework in the sense of thou shall have stakeholder en engagement, thou shall have innovative governments, etc. So we can read the, the framework and apply it as, as we see fit, but with the understanding, as was already mentioned, that that uh, findings are, are context dependent of how we interpret these findings also uh, is highly context dependent. 
Okay, thank you. That was a really good observation. I, I like that different different area between the different uh, points. And, uh, it was helpful to kind of separate it out like that. You know, I think maybe this is, we are right at about um, an hour and a half now. We're going to wrap up the webinar, but if everyone would like to just kind of maybe end on one final uh, reflection, you know, maybe things that you've picked up from the webinar. Um, I know you've all worked together. You, you all kind of know each other. Um, but maybe just sort of where you see the process going from here. Um, I know Aziz has already told us that um, in Brasilia in uh, what, about a month now, uh, there'll be uh, some more presentations, more work on this, but you know, where are you taking, you know, um, in your own work or where do you see kind of work being picked up and going on in the future? To each um, of you. Maybe two, two quick things on my side. I think this was for us a, a beautiful way to make sure that uh, we find uh, um, modalities for engaging members of the Water Governance Initiative in between meetings. Um, and, and I think that that was successful. So we need to think of, uh, of potential follow up uh, to go in this direction and to make sure also that those who cannot physically come to the meetings uh, can play a role. So I think in between all the co-authors and the members of the editorial board there was over 25 members out of 100 that uh, played an active role in this special issue so i take very good uh, outcomes of it um the second one on the follow-up maybe in three years we can have a special issue on lessons learned from the indicator framework and their implementation that's what i would uh, probably offer i think the next report in brasilia um will provide the tool we hope that uh, there will be a massive uptake from stakeholders governments to use it as a self assessment tool we're not monitoring we're not benchmarking here but that we can in three years learn lessons from um, uh, what what this helped do or not do and uh, adjust as need be and probably there another uh, combined effort of science and policy would uh, would be very relevant excellent thank you who who, who would like to thank give you thoughts? okay uh, so I guess I have I have uh, two things to share. So on the one hand, we had zoomed in uh, on, on one particular principle. Uh, and of course, we would like to share our understanding of, of, of social learning as a way of, of unpacking uh, stakeholder engagement into the indicator work that's going on right now. Um, we are involved both as IHE, but also the, the co-author organizations are all involved in the water governance initiative. So we'll, we'll take this up directly with the OECD to see how, how the work that we have substantiated in our paper can fill, uh, fill, feed into the indicator work and, and particularly for the stakeholder engagement uh, principle. But secondly, I've also learned a lot from the other presentations, which were very, the papers are very different in nature, completely the opposite, uh, testing entire frameworks, etc. So there's um, a lot of exciting reading, not only for myself, but I, I also see a long reading list already shaping up for my PhD and master's students. So uh, thank you very much for that to the uh, co-panelists. I'm sure your PhD and master's students are thrilled by this long reading list that's shaping up. <laughs> uh, who would like to go next? Can go. Um, okay. Uh, following uh, with the uh, words, of course, it was a pleasure to, to be here. Thanks, Scott, and uh, for uh, managing the our communications. And uh, uh, thanks you all, Uta, Pierre, Claude, for sharing uh, your ideas. And uh, of course, there will be a lot of reading for all of us. Um, I will also include in the presentation in the PDF that I will send to Scott the link for the our paper. I didn't think of that, and it was good to, to do that, Uta. It was a nice idea. Uh, I think that uh, from now on, what uh, I've been challenging some of the co-authors, we are spread around the world, but it would be interesting to go into some specific case uh, and understand how this uh, policy implementation in a broader sense um, can be done addressing the challenges that we identified so we could focus on one specific country. But there's also the other very interesting idea of connecting uh, international policy tools and uh, methodologies. We have the revision of uh, the Water Framework Directive arriving now, and it will be really an opportunity to discuss better and deeper what uh, can be improved uh, in the Water Framework Directive, but also uh, it could be interesting to understand better in the OECD countries what are the, the main uh, aspects of uh, 
as we conclude more holistic approaches, more integrating more the, the processes from upstream to downstream and in time as well. So talking about time scales and spatial scales. And uh, all of this can give way to thousands of papers <laughs> and, and research uh, things. But the main point is how do we influence water governance to become better and more multidimensional? And I, I am very happy that I participated in this webinar and I hope that uh, people um, that were listening to us can feel more inspired towards that. And thank you very much uh, to OECD and uh, to IWRF for organizing this. Well, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Very short. Uh, I think that there's a lot to expect from the indicators so as to com complement the qualitative analysis with some quantitative data. And hopefully that will, the, our, our webinar will have inspired some of the participants to look at the indicators when they will be available and to develop empirical analysis based on that, because that will be a way to check the validity of the framework, but also to improve it and develop different aspects. Thank you. Thank you all. Pierre? So my last remark is that technology is wonderful when it works. And anyway, uh, gathering in Brasilia will be a very good way of uh, <laughs> following our discussion. And uh, so, 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 so sad uh, that I couldn't take part in all the discussion. But uh, see you in Brasilia. It will be a very good, good experience. Excellent. Well, that's a good way to kind of sum it up. And for those of you, I'm not going, but those of you who are going to Brasilia, I hope you have a great time. Um, I want to thank all of my panel for uh, joining us here today. Uh, thank you for taking some time out of your day and writing these papers and working on all these projects for so long. Um, so thank you, Aziza Azmoush, uh, Claude Minard, Suzanne Neto, Uta Wen, and Caroline Roche. Uh, thank you, each of you, for joining us. Um, many of you in the audience have asked, you know, how can you get these papers? How can you get these presentations? All this will be available on our website. If you just go to www.iwra.org, you'll see at the top there's um, a lot of options. You can go over to uh, projects and webinars, and we have all this listed. Uh, we'll have a recording of the webinar posted soon, and um, we'll have all the presentations uploaded soon as well. Um, so give us a couple days and you can go to the website and follow up on these and listen to as many times as you like. Um, you know, some of the panel and uh, IWRA itself are all on Twitter. So if you're interested in following us on Twitter, go ahead and look us up and give us a follow. Um, and, you know, particularly related to these presentations, um, like I say, this is um, based on a special issue of our flagship journal, Water International. And uh, some of the articles are open access. So please just go to, you can just Google it, Water International, uh, IWRA.org. Um, and you'll be able to find uh, all the open access articles from our great uh, publisher, Taylor and Francis. Um, and please also, if you feel uh, inclined, follow up on the conversations on our LinkedIn webpage. Uh, follow us on LinkedIn and uh, you know, engage more on these questions. So, um, I really hope that you all found the insights provided by our panel uh, about the OECD water governance um, issues just as, as, as fascinating as I did. And it, really for me and my own work, uh, as I'm writing here, um, it gives me a lot of material to think about in the coming days. And uh, it's going to give me a lot of creativity about how I'm going to kind of bring my own uh, writing together and forward. So um, thank you. And I hope it's all worked out and, and everyone here has learned something from this great presentation. Um, and thank you, Scott, for the nice organization of the web, uh, webinar. Thanks thank a lot. You. Very well organized. Thank you. My pleasure. It's my pleasure. It's a pleasure. Thank you for all coming and joining us. Um, just to remind everyone in the audience again that um, IWRA is a 40 year old nonprofit, non governmental educational organization. And we focus on bridging disciplines and geographies and connecting professionals, students, individuals, corporations, institutions who are concerned with uh, the sustainable use of the world's water resources. So if you are going to our website, if you are looking at the um, webinars or looking up a Water International, maybe you want to become a member. Uh, you can go ahead and join us, um, make your contribution, and become a member of IWRA to help support other projects like this. Um, 
as well as get a number of benefits like access to Water International. So um, if you're interested in learning anything more about this, the website is www.iwra.org. So I want to thank on behalf of everybody in the IWRA office and uh, all of our panel. Um, just thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.